a brown hillside framed by green trees. Beside a bookcase, a dark-haired woman sits smiling in a brown shawl over black pants and top. We are a nation of many cultures, where tradition bearers carry forward their knowledge and passion to future generations. In the process, they help us renew our dedication to living artful lives and lifting up the myriad artistic traditions that comprise our collective heritage. I'm Maria Rosario Jackson, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts and your host for our program. It is my privilege to introduce you to 10 gifted individuals who have been named as the 2022 National Heritage Fellows. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the Heritage Fellowships, the nation's highest honor in the folk and traditional arts. Nominated by fellow citizens, these artists exemplify the idea of living artful lives, drawing from their cultural legacies and sharing the gifts they have with communities in which they live. Many of our fellows come from historically marginalized communities where their artistic work is evidence of strength, resilience, and triumph. It's my honor to present to you your 2022 National Heritage Fellows. Stanley Jacobs from St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Quelpe flute player. Eva Insignias from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Flamenco artist. Shaka Zulu from New Orleans, Louisiana. Black masking craftsman. The Excelsior Band from Mobile, Alabama. Brass band musicians. Francis P. Sinensi from Hana, Hawaii. Master Hawaiian Hale builder. Taniba Natani from Shiprock, New Mexico. Navajo Dene textile artist. C. Brian Williams from Washington, D.C. Step artist and producer. Tsiring Wangmo Sato from Richmond, California. Tibetan opera singer and dancer. Michael Cleveland from Charlestown, Indiana. Bluegrass Fiddler. The legendary Ingramets from Richmond, Virginia. Gospel artists. Roots of American culture. A cross-country visit with living treasures of the folk and traditional arts. Let's start on the beautiful St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where we meet Stanley Jacobs, the foremost advocate and practitioner of the music of Quelbe. While updating traditional instrumentation, Stanley maintains the integrity of the music, keeping its sharp-witted humor and social critique. Let's listen. St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands. Stanley Jacobs, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. Music is part of my life. I, I, I have a song in my head all the time, you know. As we speak, I'm hearing a tune now. That, that's how, that's how it fits with, with, with me. Well, the music is the, the music of the Virgin Islands, the music that we play. When close to the 60s came, then a lot of stateside music from America started coming in, and, and, uh, and then that overwhelmed the Equal Bay, and it started going to the background. It was few and far between. That music was dying out. Sangwa. Clouded sunlight filters down to the sea. I was drafted. So I spent two years in the Army. Black and white photos. While I was in the Army, I was playing guitar. I started playing with two guys from California. Because we were going to get out of the Army at the same time, we said, let me form a band and we'll go out and play the music, man. We're going to meet in Chicago. I said, well, let me go home first. Let me check my people first before I do that. And when I came down here, I forgot about that. 
He opens a case of flutes. I got a job with the, what they used to call welfare. The job was a social worker at the Home for the Age. And the job was to actually make them feel like they're not there to wait to die. We used to make plenty parties for them. On a porch. I was introduced to the flute by Stanford Simmons, who was my co-worker. Me and Stanford used to play the guitar and the flute. At a home for the age, some of the residents, they used to call me and tell me that they have a tune for me. That's how I learned the songs. One day I met up with one of my friends. His name was Greenbug. We decided together that we were going to form a band. The 10 Sleepless Nights with a K. began in 1970. So we're 52 years old now. We consider the premier Kualbe band. We're the best, you know, see there? Pointing to his T-shirt. The best you could find. Speaking into a phone. Thank you, thank you. New York Yankee School. Some, is it something went wrong? <laughs> Try again. <laughs> New York Yankees. New, English. New York Yankees. What I say? New York Yankees, man. <laughs> but you're supposed to say. Yeah. Stones. Yeah. Say, 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 say Yankees, man. Yeah. Yeah. New York Yankees scores. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> At the very beginning, my friends used to tell me, man, you, we were doing a quell betting, man. We, you, you were you an educated man. You ain't, you ain't got to be doing them thing, you know. It was considered low class. Only drunken people play that. When I was being told I shouldn't be playing it, the very first time I heard it, I... Tapping his heart. I'm sorry. Hurt, they hurt. But that was at the beginning. An outdoor concert at the top of a sloping street. Blue lights dance atop police cars. When we kept on playing, people started saying that this is our music. This is music from here. We should lift it up. This is ours. Playing on a platform trailer, parading through the streets. Early Burke. Oh, they're the band. They're the band. They own the place. Kareem Smith. If you don't know Stanley and Tiny Super Nights or you don't know Stanley Jacobs himself, I don't think you even live here. Lisa Harris. Every time you hear a food plan, you know Stanley is around. Judge Emil Henderson III. Hundreds of residents, old and young, follow the parade, dancing in the streets. Pendle, Casey, Henry. You know, I grew up in the housing community. Music on a whole really detour me from that other life. So being the, one of the youngest member in the band, I think my main goal is to preserve the culture and to make sure that the next generation of Virgin Islanders get opportunity to live it. It identifies us. It's important for people to know who they are, to have something to say, that's mine. Eva Insignas comes from one of the few established flamenco families in our country. Her passion for this art form led to founding a dance company in 1973. And in 1982, a center of learning called the National Institute of Flamenco. Let's take a look. Sunlight filters through branches as an older woman spirals her arm. Eva Insignas, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. Flamenco is much more than a study of dance and music. It really is a study of culture and social issues. 
The gypsies were not accepted in any country. So it became a voice for people that had no voice. Flamenco is a way of life. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Walking dogs. I started studying flamenco with my mother in her beautiful studio here in Albuquerque, and I loved it. I loved all of it. Book titles include The Gypsy in My Soul. Eva sifts through a box of old photos and programs. It's unusual in the United States for there to be flamenco families. I mean, we're one of the few. Vintage photos of dancers and parties. I came from a wonderful family. My mother and father were wonderful people. But, you know, as many families, it was complicated. It was difficult at times. Um, and flamenco became my anchor. I started studying at the University of New Mexico as an undergraduate student and had been there for three years when they asked me to start teaching flamenco there. A younger Ava advances in a blue gown. Well, they wanted to know more about flamenco. Young Ava dances, her face wrenching. The musicians have to completely understand the baile, the dance, and the dancers have to completely understand the music. I stopped my degree in dance because at that time, you could not get a degree in the program that you were teaching in. And I didn't want to stop teaching because I didn't want to lose the momentum that I had started to build. I decided, okay, well, I won't continue with the degree but I will continue to teach. Having the opportunity to teach at the university, I felt that it was my responsibility to then take that as far as I could possibly take it. 35th Festival Flamenco Albuquerque. Near a stage, Ava smiles in a festival t-shirt. I started Festival Flamenco in 1987. It has grown in scope tremendously. Distributing programs to an audience. One of the flamenco historians, they call them flamencologists. When he came here to see what we were doing, he said, this isn't a flamenco movement, it's a flamenco revolution. The experience of performing is immediate. What we take in a performance, we take right there. On the other hand, the experience of teaching the flamenco dynamic is much more long-term. It's a process of taking a student and walking them through a journey. Navarres and Sinas. It's, it's completely impossible to summarize because it's been really my entire life. Holding castanets. When you're dancing, it's just yourself, your physical self. And so you spend so much time learning about yourself. My grandmother really guided that, really gently starting when I was three, four years old. So I'm leaving you in excellent hands and go for it. Nodding to her grandson. Everything I know has come from that. It isn't our goal to make it look easy. We want to see the effort. We want to express the intensity that it takes to make the art form happen. Dancers stomp and twist. With as much intention and joy as ever. 
That makes me happy. Through a language I have lived with throughout my life, I have this treasure to be able to share with people. And I want to do it as long as I can. Ava smiles, nodding repeatedly. Performers bow. Ava beams, applauding in the front row. Shaka Zulu is a culture bearer and teacher of the long-standing tradition of black masking. His command of the art form includes creating intricate suit designs and African-born traditions such as stilt dancing and drumming. Let's see how this tradition continues to thrive and evolve. Shaka Zulu, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. I used to say I am a stilt dancer. I'm a drummer, I'm in the masking tradition. I study history, I'm a chief. I heard Donald Harrison Jr. He described this culture as Afro New Orleans music and culture. It just kind of sums up everything that we do that's in African tradition, but it's born right here in New Orleans. New Orleans, Louisiana. I grew up in the culture before I really knew that I was doing something that was African tradition because for us, it was a way of life. And I had great uncles who masked. My dad was part of drum societies. So as a child, I grew up watching that. And before I knew I was doing something African, I thought I was just doing something New Orleans. I was in another tribe for about 17 or 18 years before I started my tribe. When you don't document tradition, other people document for you. If you don't say Mardi Gras any, people have no idea what you're talking about. I don't like that term because we really didn't have much to do with Mardi Gras. We weren't allowed to do Mardi Gras with Europeans back in the day. So the culture basically started out of resistance. In our neighborhoods, we have those traditions on the same day, a different part of town. We represent the Sixth War in the Treme area. I'm 54, I haven't done Mardi Gras in the French Quarter ever in my life. A bejeweled beaded mask. The suits are the most important part of it. You put a mask on, you become that energy. It takes a year to build these suits. Most of my suits come in a dream, but my inspiration on building suits are places I've been issues that I'm passionate about, and of course, the continent of Africa, because that's my lifestyle. Egypt has so much material, you know, so it's very easy to do a suit on Egypt. But this suit is special. This suit was inspired by a trip that my wife did this year to do more research on hieroglyphics, but to actually uh, put it together so it can tell a story, it's a different type of art form. So this is a very special suit. At a table, Shaka sits sewing by hand. Many times when somebody is new in a tribe, you have to teach them how to sew the suits, and you gotta make sure that they finish. Nia Zulu. Shaka is my dad. The traditions that my dad has taught me are important to me, not only because he taught me them, it's also important because it's a generational thing. You're just giving it a little space. Carrying this forward means a lot to us. It's the ankh that's going on top the of it. It's not going there. It's going to be just like that. It's very important to remain true to who we are as a people based in the city that we call New Orleans today. <laughs> you just don't know what's going to happen. You don't know how your situation may change. You don't know how the world may change. Once Katrina hit, we realized how important this culture was. Gathering drums. So once people started coming back to New Orleans, that's when you started seeing more and more people joining the tribes. Stilt walkers dance. It was a wake up call for us that we really have to take these practices very serious and pass it on. Something that we grew up doing or grew up watching 
It's a way of life for me. Chaka and Nia dance together on stilts. Founded in 1883, the Excelsior Band has been marching through Mobile, Alabama in Mardi Gras parades since its beginning. The black-led brass band is a fixture in Mobile, immediately recognized by the suit, the cap, the tie, and of course, the great music. Mobile, Alabama, Excelsior Band, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellows. When I mention that I'm a member of the Excelsior Band, People are just amazed, like, oh my God, I done met a member of the Excelsior Band. It's kind of legendary around here. It's such a part of Mobile culture. The reputation is very prestigious. They have a sort of wise aura to them. Creole Fire Station number one, Hosea London. Excelsior Band began in Mobile, Alabama in 1883 by a group of firemen at a firehouse that still exists downtown Mobile, Alabama. And during their breaks, they would go upstairs and they would practice. Usually when you arrive in Mobile, the first thing people will tell you is that Mardi Gras started in Mobile. Look in Canada. My friends from New Orleans would be like, man, Mobile is not the birthplace of Mardi Gras, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it's, <laughs> we always have a strong debate. The Excelsior Band's role in Mardi Gras in Mobile is to lead the parades. And the Excelsior Band has always been a part of that tradition. People stay in this band until, basically until they can't play an instrument. Somebody almost has to die for you to get a spot in the band. Herbert Nelson. Members just don't come and go. When you're in, you're in for life. I was Theodore Arthur Jr. 23 years old when I first came into the band. When you love what you do, you just do it till you can. We want to make sure that this is a tradition that continues for hopefully another hundred years. Music students. Do G concert and we're going to do half notes. So it's going to be da, da, da. And we're going to go from there. We're going to do quarter notes. We're going to do eighth notes. We're going to do 16th notes. We're going to do 32nd notes. We're going to do 64th notes until you learn this scale. Here we go. One. Two, the jazz studio is a year-long program. The idea of that is to expose our students to traditional jazz. Aaron Coven. I've been working with jazz studio as long as they've been around, however many years, more than 10. Ty Hartman. It's amazing learning from a member of the Excelsior Band because very rarely are you in the presence of a musician that's like that good. Derek Johns. It's because of them that I really understand the traditions of jazz and how to play it, but not only how to play it, but actually enjoy it. They didn't have to teach me how to play a scale for me to get into music. I started getting into music just watching them walk down the street. They asked me to join the band for Mighty Gross this year, and I consider it an honor. It's always something that I want to do in my life. My dad got a call. At that point, I was already, you know, doing some stuff with the Excelsior. And then he told me, and at the time, I wasn't even sure how to react, but I was like, wow, I'm an official member now? It's a small family. It's just a good time all the time. Every time we get together, we're going to have some fun. We joke with each other and, and just have a good time. It's part of a 139-year fraternity, a brotherhood. The men that played before me were great 
in their own right as musicians in the city. When I die, I'm gonna have this Excelsior band uniform on, and I'm gonna have my saxophone. This is what I will wear. Being from 1883 to just being in the South, the Jim Crow era, segregation, I have great confidence that the Celsius Band will continue on. I sort of look to them in their accomplishments as a way of building myself up. I also have sort of a, you know, a torch to carry. to just be able to know that you can make an impact on someone, you know, that's, that's the great feeling. Now, we travel to the islands of Hawaii, where Francis Sinensi, affectionately known as Kumu Palani, has been revitalizing traditional Hawaiian architecture and masonry called Hale. Kumu Palani is committed to mentoring a new generation of practitioners in this important traditional art form. Let's take a look at this distinct community practice. Oahu, Hawaii. Men on a coastal hilltop. Francis P. Sinensi, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. Francis P. Sinensi. There are three things that are really, really necessary for the life of the Hawaiian or the Kanaka back in the old days. The canoe, the land, and the hale. An open-air thatched roof with wooden supports. Building a holly is a very labor-intensive endeavor. It's a thatched house with a definite architectural style. You have corner posts, you have wall posts, you have wall plates, you have rafters. Everything that we name on the holly, you have in the modern wooden house. I think I have built more than 300. I've lost count. A black and white family photo. My mother was native Hawaiian and my father was an immigrant sugarcane worker from the Philippines. So I'm hapa. I grew up eating out of our garden, went to the ocean almost every day. And I remember pounding poi for my dinner. It was fun. Grinning in a sailor's hat. I joined the Navy because I wanted to see the world. I was in the service for 29.3 years. Standing in a dress uniform. I was a chief master sergeant. I was supposed to stay for 33 years, but I decided that I was gonna get out and become Hawaiian again. And since that time, that's all I've been doing a cloudy blue sky beyond the bamboo rafters, driving a pickup truck on a rural road. I grew up as a true blue American, spoke American, thought American, wrote American, and I didn't even know how to speak Hawaiian. I dove deeper going back into my culture. Hey, moo, Oya. One day somebody says, Uncle Polani, can you go build us a holly? And I looked at her and I goes, what, what's that? She says, a holly peely. I don't know how to build a holly. She goes, I'm taking you down to Waimea Falls Park, and I'm going to introduce you to Uncle Rudy. He'll show you how to build a holly. Felling a tree. 
and the rest is history. Three men carry a log on their shoulders. What really, really motivated me is the double hull sailing canoe that went around the world. Halle Symposium. Well, if these guys can do the canoe thing, maybe I can do the Halle thing. First thing you build in the Halle, you tie a knot. Hop, hop, hop. Lo Lima. It brings people together. Stripping off bark. It's Lo Lima means many hands make light work. Whoa! Now the first thing we have to do is cut the waha. Take that one, put them across here. Several people carry a log together. Within a hale, a woman leads children in a dance. Tiana Malina Terengopatehi Moiha. Papa Hina o Lua Lua Le. Ka samana mana. And now we're gonna do our rocks and ha he hu. Ha, he, hu, ha, he, hu, kui, kui. And then we say karuna po, you ready? Ha, he, hu, ha, he, hu, ha, he, hu, one more, ha. We are very proud and very supportive of our uncle and just grateful for his unconditional commitment and love to not only the practice but to Hawaii. When you're able to build a cultural safe space in community that changes everything. That sense of belonging, of understanding of who we are as Kanaka and feeling that I'm able to continue this sacred and beautiful Ikikupuna. Kaino Holt. Although Kumu is now well known for Hale building, at one point he was just another Hawaiian just trying to do something for his culture. If I was never given the opportunity to learn Hale building, then I would never have gained all of the beautiful life experiences that make me who I am today. Drawing on a person's hand. So all of us that got tattooed today show that discipline, that, that dedication to the cause, which would be not letting Hale building fade away. What it'll create is a family that will always stick together and share knowledge. Only through the exchange of knowledge can we truly shape ourselves and gain a better understanding of who we are in the world, who we are as a human, as a person. A 20-foot hale stands finished, its thatched roof rustling in a breeze. I hope men and women can carry on this tradition because it's not just necessarily about the hale itself, it's about building community. On a grassy ridge, a little boy fashions a one-foot hale. Every year, the NEA awards one fellowship to a keeper of tradition who, through their efforts as a cultural advocate, has been instrumental to the health of the traditional arts in the United States. From ranching traditional Navajo churro sheep to harvesting and dyeing their wool, to weaving textiles on a loom, this year's best Lomax Hawes Fellow, Taniba Natani, is keeping alive the art of Dine or Navajo weaving. Let's visit Taniba at her ancestral homeland in New Mexico. A pickup truck on a desert highway, Shiprock, New Mexico. Tanabi Natani, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. I grew up in Fort Defiance, Arizona, and it wasn't until I was about 10 years old we made the move back here to our ancestral lands. My parents were sent to go to school off our lands here. The boarding school wanted to destroy their traditional upbringing, but they were still connected to their traditional way of life. Weaving geometric patterns on a loom. When I was young, I came home from school and my mom had a loom set up for me. And she told me, today you're going to learn how to weave. Passing yarn between vertical threads, then brushing it down against woven strands. After high school, I joined the military. 
and my weaving stopped for a moment. Sprinkling water on an earthen floor. Uh, around two years into my active duty, I was in the Philippines. And one Saturday morning, I went out to a market and I saw woven mats and I touched every one of them. Pantomiming with her hand. I touched every one of them and I said, I'm a weaver. I know about this. Woven articles hang on weathered walls. I took that as a sign from the deities. I need to come home. Stepping out of the pickup truck. Sheep in a pasture. I came back and I started ranching the sheep and I started weaving. Carrying a spindle wound with wool. When I began to, to raise the sheep, they became my teacher and I became a student. They became my children. I had to care for them just like I would my family. Feeding by hand. Grabbing a woolly sheep's horns. Now there's a lot of challenges. The rains are less. Our sheep are now in the Chuska Mountains at a higher elevation among the trees. Cheering by hand. Climate change has affected this way of life of having sheep. Good job. Doing good. I have 17 sheep now. We'll have to reduce, even maybe to eight, but we're not going to no sheep. Wall hangings and knickknacks include a pendulum clock shaped like a sheep with swinging tail. Beneath a pale sky, carrying a metal tub of water. If you're a rancher, you hang on to your sheep despite all the hardships. Soaking shorn wool in the water. A Navajo weaving is made with a lot of spirituality. Another woman combs wool. <laughs> when you're weaving, you are handling the warp, which represents rain, a vertical Navajo loom, which the bottom represents the earth, and the top represents the sky. The corners of the loom represent our four sacred mountain. The weaving has a spirit. The weaving has a heartbeat. A hazy desert landscape. As a Navajo traditional Diné woman, I have to find a way to keep this life way going because I have a daughter. I have a granddaughter. I have a community. A man leads the flock of sheep. Two Native American women. Why do I walk this path as a Navajo weaver? It's my identity. An elderly woman sits on the ground, winding wool around a spindle. The arts that are linked to our culture is very important. And it's very important that we tell that story. <laughs> Stepping is a percussive, highly energetic dance form that was developed by Black fraternities and sororities in the early 1900s. With that, it is one of the youngest folk arts we have celebrated over the years. Hailing from Washington, D.C., our next Heritage Medal recipient, C. Brian Williams, founded Step Africa, a company dedicated to stepping and primarily credited with introducing the art form to the American theater. Let's watch. Cars pass on an urban street, a stepping rehearsal, black men and women. C. Brian Williams, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. I've seen 
so many dance forms around the world, and there's nothing that's quite exactly like stepping. We've been starting to do a lot more research into its origins, and it's taken us deep into American culture, telling us stories that we've never heard before. A sunlit building crowned with a spire. Stepping is a highly energetic, polyrhythmic, percussive dance form created by African-American college students. We're on the yard of Howard University. This is like the main gathering place where students kind of hang out, come in between class. And this is actually the place where I first saw the tradition of stepping. I'll never forget 12 o'clock on a Friday and seeing all of the different fraternities and sororities gathering, sometimes singing songs, sometimes stepping. I was really, you know, struck by the community that I saw on campus. I think from that point on, I was kind of, kind of hooked. A man brings his fists together, then extends his arms. I just enjoyed the pure performance of it, doing it with my frat brothers. Stepping was a way of passing down traditions and culture. When I think of 1739, or Africans first being brought over to the country, I think about trying to survive a very difficult period in history. And what can you bring with you from whoever you were before you got to these shores? And so stepping to me is a part of that resilience, of that redefining. A question comes about a lot for me is why is the drum somewhat absent in African-American communities? And why is the body so often used as a drum? So I'm talking about tap and uh, ham bone and patting juba and the ring shout. These are all percussive dance forms that um, have been practiced in African-American communities ever since the drum was taken away. When I graduated from Howard University, I ended up taking a fellowship to live and work in Lesotho, a small country landlocked by South Africa. And I'll never forget, I saw a little boy on the side of the road uh, in a big pair of gum boots. And he uh, was hitting the boots and he was making some music with the boots. When I saw that, I was struck. Went and spoke with my students and they told me it was the South African gum boot dance. That is what really motivated me to want to create a connection. Take some of my frat brothers from Howard University to Johannesburg, South Africa, meet and connect with artists there and then see what happens. So it, it, it transformed from a one idea to a lifelong pursuit. Street clothes and African masks. When Step Africa began, you know, we were the first professional company dedicated to the art form of stepping. And now, we're one of the largest African-American dance companies in the world today. Mfaniso Akpon, artistic director. Step Africa has been able to really push the art form forward and tell stories, tell American history stories. And that's something that's important to capture. It's something that's important to spread. We are cultural ambassadors. Dancers perform gymnastics. Step Africa is absolutely dedicated to working with young students. I mean, that's how we started. Children in an auditorium. We serve about 20 to 25,000 kids every year. Attention. We also love performing in an elementary school and in some rural town in Mississippi, right? Or in some village in South and Central America, right? Each, all of these venues are equally important to Step Africa, without question. There's nothing like it in the world. It is uniquely tied to this country and the evolution of African-American people in this country. So because of that uniqueness, it makes me want to preserve it even more. Yeah. 
As they file out, dancers fist bump. Our next honoree, Tsiring Wangmo Sato, is co-founder of the Tibetan dance and opera company Chaksampa. Exiled from her country since birth, she's never set foot on her familiar homeland of Tibet. However, through the strong teachings of her elders, she is determined to keep alive Tibet's song and dance here in the United States. A sunlit hillside, Richmond, California. A woman steps past a lengthy row of spinning cylinders covered with Asian characters, turning them one at a time. Si Ring Wangmo Safo, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. On a kitchen counter, a woman rolls out balls of dough, then serves flat loaves to people gathered around a dining table. I was born in a refugee settlement. My parents followed His Holiness the Dalai Lama to India as a refugee. I came to the U.S. in 1989 to join two other artists and perform in a festival in Texas. Later, we toured many cities in the U.S. and uh, that inspired us to found it Chaksampa. Tibetan opera group. And carry on music to the wider audience and educate the youngers and uh, refresh the memory for the elders. Chaksampa means Iron Bridge. It's the name of a Tibetan saint who founded Tibetan opera. We consider a bridge between elders and younger generation. We learn from elders, and then we pass it to younger generations. Playing a nose flute. Tibetan opera is something that takes a lot to put on. It is very special coming together, all the artists. We all studied under same uh, masters. It's like a family reunion. Women dance in a backyard. Having a group like Chaksampa through music, we can introduce our struggles. Being the voice of Tibet's brothers and sisters who are living under Chinese oppression. Being born in a refugee settlement, I've never seen my country, never been there. But um, hearing again and again, I felt like I've been there. Opera festival, it's a huge thing for Tibetan people. Colorful faded flags covered with writing flutter in a breeze. When I was little, I know my parents had gone through a lot. And uh, this is making me emotional. I have seen my family, my parents, and many other Tibetans. Wiping her eye. Feel so much hardship. My mom always prays that what they went through, no one should go through. That kind of hardship, I grew up with not only me, so many Tibetans. When I was a child during Tibetan New Year, my parents and all the elders come together and do the ceremonial dance and song. That's the first time I saw my parents so happy. Putting on colorful costumes in a dressing room. Song and music has power to heal, bring people together with hopes. So many great masters from Tibet, many are gone, they pass away but their legacy is still living. They have a huge impact. An auditorium.
Tibetan opera carries Buddha's story. This is an art form rooted deep in our culture. It reminds you practice loving, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness. I didn't realize that when I was young, but now all the lyrics that I think about it, it's a truly a teaching. Michael Cleveland grew up in Indiana listening to bluegrass music. He began playing the fiddle at age four and then took violin lessons at the Kentucky School for the Blind in Louisville. Proving himself a prodigy, Michael has become one of the premier bluegrass fiddlers in the country. Let's listen. Charlestown, Indiana. All right, if Welcome to my porch. I've never played on your porch. I know. Michael Cleveland, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellow. When I was a kid, I had one thing on my mind, and that was music. I don't know why I chose bluegrass other than I was always around it. Childhood photos. My grandparents were really into bluegrass music. They actually started a bluegrass show in Henryville. I would either be at their show or there were shows going on in Scottsburg and Madison, Indiana. I would say the first time I ever remember hearing bluegrass would have been at one of those. We've got a special guest instrumentalist with us this evening. A gymnasium. When I was real little, I heard the local fiddle player play Orange Blossom Special. I heard that and then it was like I had to do it regardless. That's what did it for me. I don't know what it was. I guess all the different sounds that the fiddle made during that song that captivated me, but I was obsessed. If you were a fiddle player that could play Orange Blossom, and if I was around, I would be aggravating the hell out of you, <laughs> just trying to figure out how you play that. I think I asked so many of the same bands so many times, you know, hey, do you have a record that has Orange Blossom on it? That's all I wanted to talk about. Well, we've got a fine fiddle player here on the left-hand side. What do you think? Michael opens a mandolin case. He strings the mandolin, sliding his fingers along it. And there's been quite a few people in my life that have taken the time to make sure that I got a chance to hear the music that I needed to listen to. You know, all right, here's this Bill Monroe record. Here's Jim and Jesse. You know, here's Flat Scruggs, the Stanley Brothers. Listen to the fiddle playing on these records and try to imitate that, which I am thankful for because that gave me basically the fundamentals. Not only was I learning new stuff, but I, I had an appreciation for traditional bluegrass that I don't know that I would have had otherwise. The thing with bluegrass 
It's a very down-to-earth kind of music where there's a lot of chance to meet your heroes, people that you listen to on stage, and even get the opportunity to play music with them. With Doc Watson, 1988 NEA National Heritage Fellow. When I met Doc Watson the first time, it was just like hearing Doc on an album and to know that they were visually impaired. Really, if I hadn't heard or been aware of, of people like that, I don't, I don't know that I would have tried to go after music as a profession. I've got to sort of take my handicap kind of lightly. I don't know if you've had yours all your life or not, but I, yeah. I never could see. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think of it too much. I mean, you know, there's some things I can't do, but I'm going to make do with what I can do. You will make do with what you have, son. Yes, you can. You've got a God-given talent that nobody can rob you. In 2006, I started my band called Michael Cleveland and Flame Keeper. The International Bluegrass Music Association has been really kind to us as a band and to be selected as Fiddle Player of the Year 12 times was quite an honor. In 2019, my album Tall Fiddler was nominated and won a Grammy, which uh, is still kind of hard to believe. We are thrilled to death to be here at the uh, Indiana School for the Blind. We're gonna play some bluegrass for y'all, and we don't know any other kind of music, so if you don't like bluegrass, you're out of luck. <laughs> All right, here we go. One, two, one. Looking back on it now and all the things that I've been fortunate enough to be able to do, and especially being a little kid and the people that I've been around and been able to play with. That's, man, I've, I've been pretty fortunate. Thank you all so much. A pale pink sky over verdant trees. No matter what style of music you play, I don't care if it's bluegrass or what, you need to be able to go back and, and find where things came from, why people play the way they do, for somebody else to be able to carry on the tradition, for it to be passed down. And uh, I hope people don't lose sight of that. Our next honoree is a group considered to be Richmond, Virginia's first family of gospel. Started by Maggie Ingram, a single mother in the 1960s, the group has been bringing their joy to audiences for more than six decades. Let's hear the soulful sounds of the legendary Ingramettes. The legendary Ingramettes, 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellows. I'll meet the Ingram Miller. My mom's music has reflected every step of the way that we've lived our life. Richmond, Virginia. The music, as in much of the African-American genre of music, it has reflected the times that we live in and given hope that times would always get better. Can't you see the time? It's been very important because it's allowed me to continue to tell my story. 
We were known from the beginning as those that would inspire. And that's what gospel music has always done. It's always been this good news of the gospel. It energizes you. The original Maggie Ingram and the Ingramettes were myself, my youngest sister, and my three brothers, just the five children. Mom played the piano, we sang. This is someone who had no formal musical training, but somehow she was blessed to be able to play an old upright piano on the cotton plantation where she grew up. And she sat us down and taught us to sing. Those humble beginnings began this group. My first memories of singing, sitting in a circle in the living room and my mom beating time with a stick and teaching all five of us how to sing our parts. Being left to raise five children, a daunting task when the only skill set that she had was domestic work. When she put us to bed at night, we would hear her praying, her constant prayer, God help me keep my family together. The reply that she got from God, and this is in her own words, you'll need these five children. You love to sing, you love to teach your children to sing. A vintage album with Tina Ingram Murphy and Luke Ingram. Well, Tina, these are in pristine condition. Mm -hmm. You've done well. People give me a record, it's in a brown paper bag and with mayonnaise on it. They done ate a bologna sandwich in the bag and just bread crumbs and stuff, but I, you know. Okay. Oh, right. okay. Do you realize that, that everything we've sang, it's been about our life and that's what's made it so, you know. I think that's why people can relate to it so well is because it's like, they sound like us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, yeah, yeah. She just wanted to make music. Right. If you think about it, we're only two generations removed from someone that was born and raised on a slave plantation exactly. in Georgia. Exactly. It, it, you know, when people, oh, that was 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Really? That was my mama and grandmother ago. Yeah. And, and well into the 60s and, and 70s, mm -hmm. segregation was much alive. It was, it was mm -hmm. still much alive for her to, you know, in the face of that in the face of that, to continue to travel to little country churches and the little, yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me John couldn't well, sing Mom her. Can take some beautiful pictures. She is a beautiful yeah. woman. Yeah. Listen. I it, look it, just like her. <laughs> Are you kidding? The Ingramettes came to Richmond as a family unit. And so whatever we did, we always worked as a family unit. We've been at this over six decades. We have a second generation. These are friends, relatives, God siblings that have come to be a part of who we are and what we do. Kenneth Heath. I've been in the band since I was 14 Cheryl years Maroney old. Cheryl Maroney Yancey. I was 12 years old. Carrie Ingram Age Jackson. Age 19. Randall Court. About 20 years myself. Calvin Curry. 20 years. Valerie Stewart. 20 years. Stewart Hamlin. 19 years. All of us are brothers. We make it do what it do. As a child coming up, the Ingram Mess, it was like rock star status to actually get to see them live and that's why it's such an honor to be a part of a legacy that had preceded all of us i'm telling you my hand to god when the ingramettes hit the building you knew it mom maggie was one of those persons that even through time the amazing part about her was she could sing to young and she could sing to the old, all at the same time. She could say one word. I mean, and they could make a whole song out of one word. To me, that was just incredible. She left it in the hands of our meeting. And at this point, I thought we couldn't go any higher. My mom's homecoming was attended by approximately four to 5,000 people. And it was a grand celebration. People from all over came to celebrate her. They came to celebrate her legacy and what her music had meant to them. The buses here, they changed all the signs on the bus to say RIP Evangelist Maggie Ingram. Everything stopped for, for a celebration and her dying wish. You guys keep this group going, you keep this group together. 
In renaming the group, I always wanted to continue to honor my mom. In one of our meetings, one of the group members said, you know what, I mean, you're legendary. You're le and, and that's how it stuck, the legendary Ingram S. When I stand before the people to sing, I'm not representing myself, but I'm representing the kingdom. And so when I'm in rehearsal, I sing just as hard as I do when I'm on a stage, and any of my group members will tell you that because I may not make it to the show Sunday. This may be my last night. He may call me home tonight, and this may be my last time singing. That's what fuels me, the fact that I am a kingdom representative, not just a, an Ingram representative or a Richmond, Virginia representative. I am a representative of the kingdom. That's what fuels me. That concludes our cross-country tour of some of the roots of our rich and diverse American culture with the 2022 NEA National Heritage Fellows. Thank you for joining me in celebrating these brilliant artists and their contribution to our artistic landscape. See you next year. This film was produced by Hypothetical in association with the National Council for the Traditional Arts, presented by the National Endowment for the Arts. Credits scroll, including Host, Maria Rosario Jackson Director-Producer, Olivia Marion Producer, Deborah A. Wilson Coordinating Producer, National Council for the Traditional Arts, Madeline Ramez Supervising Producer, National Endowment for the Arts, Cheryl T. Sheely National Endowment for the Arts, arts.gov, National Council for the Traditional Arts.